Okay. Uh, oh, oh, there it all goes. There it all goes. Sorry, everyone. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, hi. I didn't truly become a New England sports fan until I was accused of not being one. Uh, it was the winter of 2002, my freshman year at Penn. Uh, the New England Patriots would eventually win their first Super Bowl on a last-second 48-yard field goal by Adam Vinatieri. During a phone call with my Aunt Mary, the Patriots' recent success came up. Wait, but you live in Philly now, so does that make you an Eagles fan? I was surprised at the vehemence with which I responded. Absolutely not. Whether she meant it that way or not, it felt like the subtext of her question was, have you left us forever? <laughs> to change teams would be an irreversible departure. I was forging a path that took me not only outside our region, but to an Ivy League university from our working class family, and my allegiance to our teams had to remain unwavering. And there wasn't only distance felt from my family, but in my new home as well. As a first generation college student, I hadn't realized that coming to Penn would mean that I would be unique because I held a job while in school and managed my own finances. And I really didn't have much of an accent, but wicked was my favorite modifier. As in, wicked good, wicked awesome, wicked stupid. Before long, I started catching myself before I said it. Now, 15 years later, I have just about lost my wicked, and I miss it. What I didn't lose was my home team, which was actually an away team, and the attachment to my family is you get what you get, do your job values. I think the role of away team fan suits me and might even be why my allegiance has become so unwavering. Why like what everyone likes when you can like what everyone hates, even envies? <laughs> that winter of 2002 marked a change in the luck of our teams, who have now won nine championships total since that first Super Bowl victory. Four by the Patriots, three by the Red Sox, and one each by the Celtics and Bruins, if you're counting. Uh, I have loved wearing Patriots, Red Sox, and Celtics gear in Philly when Boston's in town. I love high-fiving fellow Celts fans at Sixers games, jeering at the Sixers fans who leave early when hope for their team is lost, and walking into Smith's Bar at 19th and Chestnut, which Philadelphia-based Patriots fans have made their home in recent years with wall-to-wall -wall Brady and Gron Gronkowski jerseys and every television tuned into the game. But like many fans, the living room has become my true sports home. Not my living room, but instead my friends Brad and Laura's living room in South Philadelphia, an unlikely home base for Patriots fans given its proximity to Lincoln Financial Field. In fact, the doorbell at Brad and Laura's house plays Fly Eagles Fly, a leftover from the previous owners, about the most South Philly detail one can imagine. <laughs> But when we gather on Sundays, there's no question where our allegiances lie. First, there's our attire. Brad's in my Brady jerseys, my Julian Edelman t-shirt, Laura's Patriots sweatpants, our hats and scarf and, and the Patriots poncho, featured here, uh, which Brad purchased in Mexico, and we typically don when our luck needs to be reversed. We need to score. I'm putting the poncho on. <laughs> this is also around the time that we bring out the processed cheese snacks to stress eat during the game. We can have those later. Uh, and then there's the accessories. Patriot sweatshirt clad teddy bear named Tom Bairdy. Uh, our three hologram cups featuring Brady, Gronk, and Edelman, uh, which I purchased at my grandmother's pharmacy on Cape Cod. Uh, and perhaps most import importantly, and this is not here, I should add, uh, our Patriots tequila decanter and matching shot glasses, which our friend Alex purchased for us in Mexico. Yes, Mexico uh, is a haven for NFL gear with a flair. I am not sure where exact, when exactly my father, who watches from his own couch in New Hampshire, began the tradition of enjoying a shot of tequila every time the Patriots score a touchdown or a field goal during slower games. Um, <laughs> but it is a ritual we have embraced and respected, uh, the warm bite of tequila propelling us to victory and, yes, hold on, consoling us <laughs> in defeat. In January of 2015, the Patriots entered the Super Bowl under false and vengeful allegations of having intentionally deflated footballs <laughs> to give the greatest quarterback of all time, Tom Brady, an unneeded advantage. This was no time for preemptive celebration. It was time to do our jobs. 
in the words of living legend and Patriots head coach Bill Belichick. Sometimes being a sports spectator is the perfect balance of relaxation and exhilaration. For me, football Sundays represent a break from work email, from grading papers, from campus, from long training runs. Uh, but at crucial moments, however, an outsider would not understand why we do this to ourselves. Brad had decided not, or had decided not to invite non-Patriots fans over for the Super Bowl, deeming them an unnecessary distraction. <laughs> Laura was concerned that we had purchased a different brand of tequila. Could that affect the outcome? <laughs> I was on edge generally and focused my negative energy on my boyfriend, Aaron, who first introduced me to Brad, uh, who hasn't yet been mentioned because he is the one non-Pats fan exception who often finds himself half-heartedly drinking tequila with us. Aaron's temporary allegiance was the least of our concern through the first half of Super Bowl 49. By the fourth quarter, the Patriots were down by 10, and I had started to get that tight feeling in my chest I'd also felt in 2008 and 2012 when we lost Super Bowls to the hated, overrated, and no longer relevant New York Giants. <laughs> no team had ever come back to win a Super Bowl by trailing, trailing by more than a touchdown going into the fourth quarter. Couldn't we just have this one thing? Or couldn't we just have these nine things? <laughs> Our boys began to look like themselves again in the fourth quarter with, more, with two more touchdowns and holding Seattle scoreless. It was 28-24 pats with 2.02 left in the game, meaning that Seattle would need a touchdown to win. They advanced down the field with a pass to a despised man known as Beast Mode and an improbably... <laughs> 30, completed 33-yard pass to Jermaine Curse, which threw us back to the Giants' equally improbable helmet catch in 2008. <laughs> Seattle was on the one-yard line with 26 seconds left. Why do we do this to ourselves? Why can't we just enjoy each other's company like civilized people? <laughs> I have watched what happened next more times than I can count. Despite Beast Mode's unstoppable nature when running the ball, Seattle elected to pass. Malcolm Butler, the same player who had unsuccessfully covered Curse's catch two plays earlier, read the route and cut in front of Seahawk Ricardo Laquette for an interception in the end zone, ending up back at the one-yard line. I don't remember what I did in this moment. <laughs> Brad was standing. We were all probably standing, every Patriots fan in the world, and Brad fell to his knees. I probably screamed and stared at the television, hoping that what I had seen was in fact what happened, that there wouldn't be some kind of penalty call. In place of my own clear memory here, I present some video footage of my Patriots brethren, courtesy of YouTube. We're gonna do one more here. I love the, look, watch just grandpa there. <laughs> oh, that's the wrong. No, I think just towards the end, actually. I don't know. Brady, and I guarantee you, Bill Belichick is sitting here thinking about it right now. It's on his mind, it has to be. As I watch these videos and I piece together my own memories of the rest of the night, we all embraced, we even threw cupcakes at the wall, and of course we finished the tequila. I did this, hold on, there it is, and Aaron helped. And somewhere in the tequila soaked haze of victory, I remembered not just my family, but the writer Roger Angel's essay about the Red Sox game six win in the 1975 World Series. Angel thinks of his friends and family all over New England celebrating Carlton Fisk's 12th inning home run, which would go down in history as a moment of collective euphoria. My own people filled the framework of Angel's essay. 
And I thought of them living in living rooms in Epping, New Hampshire, and Whitman, Massachusetts, in Dover and Bourne and Pocasset and Marston's Mills and East Bridgewater, my Aunt Patty in Monroe, Maine, and my Aunt Laurie, another New England expat, as it were, in Winter Garden, Florida, my grandfather, Lee Jocelyn in South Dennis, who dresses the wooden seagull on his mailbox in a mini Patriots jersey, <laughs> my grandmother, Dottie Ledbetter, who most likely left the room on that last play because she just couldn't watch, who chain smokes through all of these games, to whom I sent flowers the day after the Celtics' 2008 championship win. As Roger Angel said of the New England sports nation and of those leaping from the carpet to the couch in their socks and slippers and jerseys and hats, and all of them utterly joyful and believing in that joy, alight with it. Thank you. Thank you.